Hello, everybody. My name is Ray Dogum, and welcome to the Hyperledger Healthcare Special Interest Group meeting. Uh, we hold these meetings every two weeks. Uh, I am the co-chair, and here we have about three or four people here. Erica is the co-chair as well, Erica Bierbauer. We have Elizabeth Green on and Doug Bullitt. Uh, thanks, guys, for joining today. Um, these meetings are recorded, so anything you do say will be you know, subject to the Linux Foundation antitrust policy. And they're published, the videos are published on YouTube as well. So if you do hear anything, if you have any questions or comments throughout this discussion and you're viewing this, you know, after the meeting, um, feel free to leave some comments. We'd love to hear your questions and thoughts on the subject matter uh, that we discuss here. So I don't think there's anyone new on. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with some, just a request if there's any community announcements that you guys would like to share. Okay. Uh, so in that case, I want to get started here and discuss or just bring to your attention some of the upcoming events that are happening. Uh, right now, actually, in Boston, there's the MedTech conference going on. And lots of good speakers there. Um, so if anyone has attended or is attending, uh, yeah, let us know how you thought of the, that conference. On November 7th through the 11th, there's the IEEE Global Emerging Technologies Forum. Uh, this is a great event as well. You should check it out. Um, you know, part of the agenda includes Hyperledger blockchain. So this should be a good one. And it's all virtual and it's five days long. So that could be a really, really cool one to check out. November 9th through the 10th in London, UK, the token... 2049 Europe conference will be going on. And you can check out the link to all this in this public confluence page as well. Uh, next, we have on November 13th through the 16th in Las Vegas, the Health 2022 conference, major event. Lots of great speakers here. A big production, if you haven't heard of this one. December 1st through the 2nd in London, the Blockchain Expo Global event will be going on. Also, that'll be partially virtual as well. So lots of really great speakers here as well uh, from many different companies, including a lot of enterprise existing companies. You know, I'm just looking here, FedEx, Citigroup, BP, uh, uh, GE. So there's a lot of big companies here that are in the enterprise space. And then finally... December 5th through the 6th in California, the Next Generation Patient Experience Conference will be going on. Uh, so these are just a, a select few of the events in the healthcare and blockchain world. I'm sure there's others. If you have one that you want to share, feel free to add them in the comments. All right. Uh, does anyone have any other events that they are attending or plan to attend that they want to share here? Okay, and let's dig into some of the interesting articles that I happened to come across over the last couple of weeks. Um, this first one is interesting, pretty short. It's about Sweatcoin, which is a platform that's been you know around for a few years now. And they've been trying to basically reward users who have, um, you know, they step, they collect steps on their apps or on their phone. And the more steps that you do per day, the more tokens that you're rewarded with. And basically what this article is saying that in aggregate, all these, all this data is sort of becoming a data union. And what that means is the people, the individuals that are, you know, producing um, this, this, uh, this share to earn tokens, they're collectively empowering themselves as opposed to, you know, having large companies like Google or, or Facebook, et cetera, to, to monetize their data. So in a way they are monetizing their data instead of these larger traditional uh, web two companies. So, you know, here it says Sweatcoin, the mobile app that rewards people simply for moving has proven data unions can work at scale. Um, so there's many companies like this that do this, you know, share to earn or, you know, sweat to earn sort of model. Uh, but Sweatcoin seems to be one that is showing a lot of success and you know it talks about what's their secret sauce here 
And it's really, they argue, it's really about the way that they present the data to the user. So, um, you know, here it says, while most data unions have believed their members won't care much about the data that they're sharing, the SWIT team focused tirelessly on building a community around step data. They put data first and don't try to bury it. In almost every way, the data is their mission to create a healthier planet. So I thought this was interesting. Um, while the, just quoting here, while the sweat app rewards people instantly for generating movement until this year, those rewards have been paid out in points rather than transformable tokens. So originally they didn't have tokens. They were actually just rewarding their users with points managed by a centralized company, Sweatcoin. Uh, but now it seems they have, you know, crypto tokens and, um, while the points are instant and could be spent in consumer facing marketplace for exclusive deals and merchandise, members couldn't transfer those points into cash. But uh, now um, I believe they could. So I don't know if anyone's actually used Sweatcoin. I have, it's pretty interesting. The app is really smooth. Uh, feels like I'm monetizing my activity. So that's always good. And yeah, I just think this concept of a data union is really interesting for, for the future of decentralized health. Ray, this is Wendy. Um, I'm just hey, Wendy. curious. Um, hello. Hello, everyone. Um, is there a fee to join? No, it's free to join. At least it was when I joined. Okay. Um, let me see here. So it says very clearly on their website that they will not sell vast amount of geolocation and wellness data they now collect, even though it would appear that this is one of the most valuable assets. Yeah, I don't, there is no fee to join. Okay. Wow. That's great. Yeah. And if someone thinks otherwise, please let us know. I'm not an expert in Sweatcoin. However, data, so it says here, however, data monetization is very much on the agenda. The CEO, the founder has said he does want to offer sweat members with the choice to monetize their data. Of course, now they have numbers. Uh, those fully opt-in or zero party data sets will be ever more valuable at scale. So again, this is a complete reversal of the usual data union tactics and it has worked as a charm. So worth checking that out. The next article I thought was important to discuss here was, and this is a broader trend that we're seeing. I don't have membership to this and I was able to access it before, but let me see if I could find another similar um, article. Meanwhile, I've been trying to find an app like Data Ring, uh, like uh, whatever it is. But then Swift I found coin? this one yeah. called Aura Ring, and it seemed to be similar. It seems like eventually you'll be able to get all of these devices uh, to track your what you eat, how you meditate, how you exercise, etc. Um, lay out the data for you the way, uh, say, um, Airtable or. Uh, data cloud or whatever it's called does and then and then you can monetize that if you wish already right you don't need them to monetize it for you um but i'd like to know if anybody knows a, if you can list some of those apps in the in the chat maybe we can synchronize them i put one in the chat awesome thanks elizabeth yeah we see it um aura ring yeah, and they've also been scaling pretty well. I know my uh, my brother wears an aura ring, so he loves it. Uh, okay, so I was able to load the page here. The Mayo Clinic, which you know we all know is a one of the largest and most respected health systems in the U.S., uh, it warns it won't take most Medicare Advantage plans. So recently, and I'm not an expert in Medicare Advantage, so if there's others in here. I want to share uh, their perspective. Um, Mayo Clinic sent letters this fall to eligible Medicare beneficiaries 
received care at its Arizona and Florida facilities in the last three years, warning them that it is out of state uh, with most Medicare Advantage plans. So previously accepted, now not accepting. Uh, so this is going to be a major impact to people with Medicare Advantage plans. So, um, and if Mayo Clinic is doing this, I'm sure many other health systems are doing this, which is going to put some of some of these patients really at at risk of not having the financial ability to pay for some of these services. So just to clarify here, this notice allows the patient to make an informed selection of coverage if the patient would like to seek a plan that the Mayo that has Mayo Clinic in network. Um, So again, more complications with the landscape of Medicare in the United States uh, due to some recent laws that were passed. Um, and I bring this up mainly because I do believe that the future of healthcare could be more simplified. And I think blockchain, Web3, DLT have the potential to make things more transparent and provide some stability uh, for a lot of these patients who might not have, you know, specifically financial stability uh, for patients who, you know, are going either employee to employee, year to year, not really sure what the next year is going to hold for their for their you know, health plans. So here as a broker, um, it's important for anyone marketing Medicare Advantage plans to be aware of the network, including hospitals. The network information needs to be clear, to, needs to be made clear to the consumer. So, yeah, pretty big challenge. And I think just one more quote here. 1.4 million people each year with serious or complex illness um, for all 50 states and 140 countries. So, yeah. Any thoughts here on this or any? Perspectives from the group. All right. Sounds like similar to fraud because patients think that Medicare Advantage is Medicare and Medicare covers everything. And so I think when the, the advantage as an HMO is it, or what kind of a healthcare plan is advantage that makes it different from Medicare? Uh, I believe it adds some additional, um, you know what, I'm not going to, not really sure exactly. I don't want to say the wrong thing here, but I do know it has something to do with uh, medications, I believe. So it basically includes additional uh, financial support for medications. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to hope that some of the people listening might have some additional information to share and would love their um, you know, comments as well. Just going to load the agenda back up here. All right. The next article, I thought this was pretty interesting, claiming that Apple is going to launch a health insurance plan. Uh, in 2024, and I think that would be quite remarkable for a tech company like Apple to get involved in the health insurance space or in the market. Um, this is definitely going to put some pressure on existing traditional large insurers, and I think Apple's pretty well positioned to you know, make an impact here and disrupt how you know, traditional insurers are working. They have a lot of the existing consumer data uh, collectively. If they take, you know, all the information they collect from their their iWatch, uh, their iPhones, and et cetera, from consumers, this can impact the way they do business. So, yeah. So here, this uh, subtitle says Apple Watch or Trojan Horse, kind of stating that this the Apple Watch is really like the way into people's health space or health insurance and just general health services space potentially. 
So such a move would raise questions over whether Apple launched the watch with the long-term goal of entering the lucrative health insurance market. Um, And any is there any information in that article as to where they will be offering these insurance plans? Yeah, so I mean, like what states? Uh, I don't think they specifically say um, okay. what states that they're going to start in, but that's a good point because each state does have specific laws around how. Yeah, yeah. I was just curious. Is uh, so since I was just doing a quick search, it looks like they offer. I don't know if this. It says Apple Health. And it's offered in the state of Washington, but it could just be for its own employees um, that work there. I was just trying to learn more. I'm, I'm intrigued at how they would make this work. Me too. I think, you know, it'll be interesting to see this happen. Uh, and I don't know if they've been involved in sort of acquiring existing insurance yeah. companies. That might be one way for them to kind of jump into it. Um, and there's a, this last sentence here says the analysts predict that by 2030, a third of Apple's revenue will come from software and services. Uh, it currently represents just a quarter of the business. Wow. Okay. Um, and if you want to know the technical details, uh, uh, with a patient's consent, the physician would be able to search through patients' data and find the patient who they think is most likely to succeed with their treatments and oh. choose that patient over others. And so supposing the Apple Watch has a smoke detector on it and the doctor, the, the physician only wants to take patients who do not smoke, then they would choose the, the patient with the, the smoke detector that has never gone off or that rarely ever goes off. And, and presume that that patient doesn't smoke as, you know, as long as maybe there's a way to, to tell if the patient was actually wearing the Apple watch uh, when, you know, during the time in, in question. Wow. Yeah. And that brings up a lot of uh, privacy um, concerns and, and thoughts there too. Uh, but well, it what is... do you do with the patient consent? So for example, I would gladly give consent because my reputation is excellent. I do everything right, everything possible. And so the, the physician will look at my chart, my data and say, wow, this is a model patient. If this, if my new treatment works with anyone, it will work with this patient. And so I would get, maybe get a free clinical trial uh, procedure done. Right now, clinical trials are actually charging people, charging their human subjects to let them use their bodies to, uh, <laughs> try out something new that might fail or be fatal. Can you, really? can you hmm. explain more about that, Elizabeth? I hadn't, I had you know, I spent my entire career in clinical trials and I had not heard that. Tell me more. Of what part? About charging patients. Oh, so um, in California, there are stem cell treatments that are, oh, uh, okay. they're not standard of care, okay. anything between an initial concept in standard of care could be a clinical trial. Okay. And so you know, they, 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 they believe, the doctors believe that there's enough work done to, to show that it works in most patients or in, say, more than half of the patients. So now they're ready to start charging, and they charge maybe three, $4,000 uh, for a, a treatment. But when, um, and if it were actually a clinical trial, it, it would cost anything, or the human subject would actually get paid for their time. And so there's a, there's a huge controversy about that, of course, but as long as they can find people willing to pay, they, uh, they charge. Uh, so um, with this kind of work, it would be, you know, the, the, the physician would get much more data and the principal investigator would find out so much more about the actual um, patients who are undergoing the clinical trial. Then they would provide that to the doctors researchers, insurance companies, et cetera, who decide on a yearly basis what, is, what the standard of care is going to be. And uh, they would have more data to work with. They would be able to say, sure, okay, because this works with all of the patients, even the smokers, we're going to call it standard of care. So suddenly all of these 
experimental procedures would become standard of care and patients would have more choice of what's covered by insurance. Doctors would have more choice of what to prescribe to their patients knowing that it was covered by insurance. Over. That's interesting. Yeah, I suppose that some treatments are just so expensive that, you know, researchers aren't able to, uh, you know, find the resources to pay for conducting the trial. So if patients are willing to pay for it, um, you know, they'll make that happen. Interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, the next- so If you can pay for that clinical trial using your data, <laughs> wouldn't that be wonderful? Right. I think that's like the, the holy grail really of- um, what we're all talking about. If we can monetize in aggregate all the data that people generate in order to fund, in order to really, um, yeah, it'll fund the research that is happening. So the value of the aggregate data will hopefully supersede the cost to run these trials. And then we're, we're then we're in business, right? Uh, yeah. Next here is an article just kind of featuring a new, this isn't really that recent, well, I guess June of this year, but I thought it was it was new to me. Eggs Chain, which is a company that's trying to store records using blockchain, yeah, store the records of frozen eggs, embryos, and other specimens uh, using blockchain. So thought it was interesting. They're using NFTs, um, and the founder Wei Escala, she's a you know, she's a Web3 evangelist, and they're based in Austin, I believe. So it looks like the company was actually launched in 2018, and they have a patent um, to track the chain of custody of biospecimens on the blockchain. Um, you know, and it's not just for embryos and things like that. It's also for organs, tissues, blood, stem cells, DNA, RNA, and more. I think with the name, the, the implication is that they're starting off with the um, you know, female reproductive science first, and yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this unfolds as well. I don't know if anyone has heard of this company. Worth checking out. So is this like uh, the egg gets a name and an NFT, and then somebody can buy it and use it later on to for art in artificial insemination? I, th I don't know if it'll be that someone else will be able to use it. So here it says, once they launched the company, she led by example by having the retrieval of her eggs documented on the platform. So I think it's just to track your own eggs. In this case, her eggs are stored at the Yale School of Medicine. Right there, that's where they're physically stored, uh, which along with Boston IVF Fertility Clinic partners with Egg Chain in documenting biospecimens on the blockchain. So it's more about documenting your own. Uh, but here it says in March, Exchain held an online auction allowing people to bid for the first publicly available spot for sperm storage on the blockchain. Interesting. So you can make a bid to have your sperm stored on the blockchain. Uh, the auction garnered 66 bids, which also included the rights to an exclusive piece of artwork and a discount for storing the sperm at a participating clinic. Anyone who stores their data, stores data about their specimen with Eggchain has secure ownership of their personal, uh, sorry, of their information in their data wallet that is protected with a private key. And users can broadcast their data on the blockchain for visibility without exposing any personally identifiable, identifiable information. So that part I find to be kind of you know, might be, I could challenge that potentially because if you're, you know, using a public blockchain, people could see, you know, what transactions you might be making. And if they know, you know, your identity, uh, this might not be true, but um, other information such as the date of the egg retrieval, how many eggs have been stored and whether any medical tests were administered could also be stored in the data record. Interesting model. Yeah, well, I mean, how do you keep track if you don't say put the egg into the box that's sealed that has an NFC in it so that it tracks if somebody 
you know, the motion detector. I mean, how do you tr make sure that nobody's stealing that egg? Is that, isn't that what it's for, to make sure nobody steals that egg? It, it's not clear to me. I don't think necessarily that its use is to prevent someone from stealing uh, the, the specimen, the biospecimen. I think it's more just to track the... Um, you know, the digital information about the the egg and where it's stored and, and things like that. But again, I'm sure this is, you know, that's a great question. Some information on the website about it, but. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe we'll have her on the. So here you can take a look and see that eggs chain learning series. There's a video on this, so this might have more information. And you can actually consult with them. Uh, it's 400 bucks for 45 minutes. So could be, you know, if anyone's interested, check that out. Could be interesting. Yeah, Elizabeth, I'm not really sure how to answer your question clearly. <laughs> It seems more like this is one of those um, in the future, we might find out how women can bear children after age 35 safely. So uh, until that time, freeze your eggs because you may have a chance in the future to bear, or, you know, maybe laboratory right now, they're, they have uh, test tube babies in China and maybe one day you'll be able to make your own test tube baby. You won't have to have a child while you're still a child. You can wait till you're old and wise and have a baby in a test tube and here, save your eggs for that purpose. I right, see a lot of use for that. Sure, yeah. And I, I, mean, I know that market is also growing. So the number of women that want to wait um, until they're, you know, whatever personal choices that they make, they want to um, delay having a baby. And yeah. I'm going to move on to the next article here. This is published in Coinbase, and it kind of talks about the past, present, and future of smart contract platforms. So I just thought this might be interesting for those folks who, you know, want to get into more detail about what does a smart contract really mean uh, and how it could evolve in the future as well and really why they matter. So, um, you know, they talk about the history of use cases Interestingly, the term smart contract was coined in 1994, according to this article. And uh, the theoretical use case was a smart lean protocol. So for repossessing leased vehicles from deadbeats. Um, 18 years after uh, Zabo's musings, Nick Zabo, Ethereum, the world's first smart contract platform was launched. Um, so... Yeah, they talk about current use cases as well. Things like CryptoKitties, DeFi platforms, NFTs. And, you know, as we know, in like the healthcare market, there's so many potential use cases for smart contracts. It's kind of like the core tool uh, that can be used in blockchain to enable trustless transactions. Um And getting into some of the future use cases here, let's see. Looking here, uh, talking about banking. Um, yeah, check this out if you're interested in learning more about smart contracts. <clears throat> and if you take a look here, actually the markets have been on the uptrend very recently in the last day or two. Um, so smart contracts are getting a, uh, I guess, are more trusted, <laughs> are getting more um, val validity, let's say. But you know, you really can't base it on the market prices. Just a just a thought there. Anyways, um, <laughs> the last article here in these. There's a good. There's a good use case for that though. Is that this pa patient? Uh... It's going to provide all the data necessary for the doctor to see if the procedure worked. And as soon as that data shows up on blockchain, um, it triggers the smart contract and the, the patient, the, the uh, 
the, the provider is paid for the procedure because there's now evidence that it was successful. Absolutely. I think the insurance market, health insurance market too, can really benefit from smart contracts, both on the insurance you know, provider side, as well as uh, the consumers, individuals that are contracting with the insurance companies. We all have heard how it's sometimes really challenging to get reimbursed for the financial or for the healthcare services that you receive. Doctors also have to basically fight with some insurance companies to get paid. Um, if there was a way to streamline that entire process through smart contracts, and I know it's easier said than done, you know, but with you know some of the software tools that we have now, it is possible. You know, no longer do we have to really fax some medical history to a provider or to an insurance company to prove that a specific service actually occurred. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I think there's going to be for a long period of time, the ability or capability to, you know, retract some transactions somehow, because, you know, inevitably you're going to have some either human error mistakes that are put into the blockchain uh, that need to be reversed or, or something. So, you know, thinking about those use cases or, you know, extreme cases, I guess you can say, is going to be important. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of angry people. Uh, so, but the power to make things more streamlined is really there. So we'll see how that goes. Cool. Uh, this article here, the critical link between healthcare, cybersecurity, and health disinformation this is a well-written article I thought worth sharing, and it just discusses in more detail about um, really the state of cybersecurity and healthcare and how sometimes the data that's out there just cannot be trusted. And it's, it's really a dangerous situation for uh, you know health systems providers um, across the country and really across the world too. Um, so here, although medical misinformation has long existed, the rise of frank medical disinformation was accelerated during the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite early warnings about disinformation, misinformation early in COVID-19 uh, in the pandemic, the quick spread of vaccine disinformation has prevented uptake of COVID-19 vaccines. So misinformation has a direct link potentially to, um, you know, poor health decisions made by individuals. So being able to you know, prevent that from happening is going to be an important thing in our future. I think this part here is really interesting. Disinformation as a service. So one of the greatest shifts in information technology over the past decade has been the emergence of, of as a service models. Uh, so infrastructure as a service, et cetera. But What's interesting here is what they're saying is this information as a service can operate in a similar way. So bad actors no longer have to design a disinformation campaign, develop an access strategy for intended target populations, and build the te technological capabilities for a simultaneous launch and do all the monitoring and response activities. So that's a lot of work for these bad actors to do, right? What they can do instead is literally just hire uh, people from either the dark web or other sources and have these services run their disinformation campaigns for them. Sort of this also shields the bad actors from, uh, you know, being pinpointed as the bad actors. So it kind of just, you know, just happens on the internet somehow. Uh, and then people believe it for some reason. So it's, quite effective, I think, to do this as we've seen in COVID-19. And I think it's not just a healthcare issue. We're seeing this in the political landscape as well, um, you know, through election, misinformation, et cetera. So what are we going to do about it, right? Uh, this article kind of presents potential strategies to to mitigate these risks. Um, not to, any thoughts on this? I know this is a big issue for many people. This is Wendy. Um, I thought I would share that my son is actually studying this very question for his dissertation. 
and he just proposed his dissertation on Monday, and it got approved by his committee. And he is studying the effect of Twitter, um, twi of tweets, and uh, he uses computer science uh, scraping tools to scrape the tweets, um, natural language processing for analyzing the content. And he is comparing the effect of um, the nature of tweets in two states, Tennessee and South Carolina, as to the overall COVID vaccination rates and hospitalization rates uh, for uh, alternative treatments that were not effective, such as um, use of, um, uh, I can't remember, uh, different aspects. Uh, oh, one is uh, ivermectin prescriptions. So anyway, he's actually studying this empirically, and I am eager to, to find out exactly what he, what he is able to see for this. That is awesome. Yeah. Also very interested. So once that, you know, comes yeah. out, I'd love to read it as well. Uh, you know, we've heard anywhere from like 50% to 85% of accounts on Twitter could be just bots, like fake, fake accounts. So being able to empirically say what the real number is, or just understanding how that could impact um, society is going to be really, really important. So, Absolutely. You know, so cool. much of it is, has been anecdotal evidence. And so now uh, he's studying it empirically. Awesome. That's really cool. And the cause mob mentality. Well, I've been working on an app for decades trying to figure out how do you, how, how does artificial intelligence detect mob mentality? So, you know, the, it, it, artificial intelligence could, for example, detect that, what's it called, the telephone uh, game? You, you say one thing to one person, it just changed slightly, and the next person to say, artificial intelligence could scrape the web and find that kind of a, a chain of, um, of deceit or misinformation and, and trace it back to where it started uh, with, with all these tweets, find out where it started. So that's just one way, but until uh, children gr grow out of being susceptible to mob mentality, I'm afraid it's, uh, it, or or here's you know, what the Green Party says, everyone should get free education in the medical field so that everyone, already knows enough to be able to spot, perceive, you know, intellectually knows what's true and where to find correct information. Uh, you know, that, so I guess education could be one solution. This is Elizabeth over screen. Thanks, Elizabeth. No, I mean, education, always a, a good idea, I think. And the thing is, like, some people, some communities may not really be interested in getting involved with with learning about that so there's got to be like clever ways to incentivize people that might not normally want to engage with health education and motivate them to at least appreciate uh the data the information that's out there and be more skeptical skeptical of some of the misinformation that they could be seeing on you know on twitter tiktok instagram etc so um this this problem is going to be with us for a while i think uh, just to kind of illustrate a little bit what this article is trying to portray, uh, here's an exhibit aligned and combined tactics to combat disinformation and cybersecurity threats. So I think this is really nice for really anyone who's trying to communicate what's happening uh, at different levels of an organization and at different like, um, you know, perspectives as well. So the C-suite engagement, what they what they can do, how to gamify education. So, you know, Elizabeth, you mentioned education. This is an example of what they could be doing, uh, why it's separate from compliance, the evolution of the workforce, and, you know, what can be done about, what strategies can be employed for them, and um, go on the offensive. So, proportional investment in offensive cybersecurity. So, yeah, really good idea. Uh, so yeah, hopefully I, I think everyone on this call believes that blockchain DLT will have a role to play in helping 
to prevent misinformation and disinformation online. Um, how that's going to play out, it's still kind of an unknown, but uh, we got to have these conversations now to to find out the right solutions. Um, okay, so I have a few educational nuggets, but I just want to point out that there were some messages on the, the Zoom here. So I just want to open these articles up just to just for anyone listening in who might be curious. So the aura ring, Elizabeth, you mentioned this before. And talking about, um, you know, monetizing data and collecting data, uh, as well as Erica, you shared Shiro Health, which is a company that's also kind of paying people to do their daily activities. It's open public beta. Uh, so check that out if you're interested. And then Doug, you shared um, this article about, you know, how, the environmental and acute margin pressure on the industry level for for um, what's happening to hospitals, really. So inflation becoming a much bigger deal for, for hospitals. And we're seeing a lot of pain. And, you know, hospitals are struggling to keep their financials going and even like paying some of their employees, et cetera. So especially in um, underserved communities. So that's that's the major issue here i think so yeah uh any thoughts on those or anything else you wanted to share on those links okay well, so, on the last point I, I guess it's just a simple one really and uh, based on what we are who we are what our jobs are we tend to get fascinated with some of the more frontier esoteric issues now and then and we lose sight of the forest for the trees but, but in reality the uh, you know the crushing uh, force here is economic it's not really just hospitals but it's kind of rose to my attention my sister is a nurse and she's telling me that the hospital she works with her having to or the, the the nursing staff now is to meet their shortfalls. They're having to pay as much as $150 an hour. And she uses that just as an example for other things. So the, you know, the, in Atlanta, one of the major hospitals just shut down completely, um, leaving a big gap, you know, in, in supply on the supply side of healthcare. So there's, you know, there's almost a kind of tectonic force that is going to drive um different approaches i suppose is a better way of saying that you know the the conventional um, care models are breaking down and um, it just seemed to me that's worth reflecting on you know just you know some kind of um pedestrian level applications like uh, using it was alluded to a little earlier you know using uh, uh verify credentials and digital identities to um, identify and augment customer acquisition cost. You know, that if physicians or hospitals even can use the web to basically solicit people to volunteer their information so that it can cherry pick them, if you will, for trials or for more profitable procedures. Um, stuff like that somebody's going to make a killing you know if they figure out you know how to address simple use cases of that sort totally yeah no thanks for bringing that up i think you're absolutely right um you know us being this sort of futuristic pattern of, of thinking about the future and uh, how new technology is going to improve everything uh, we really need to also reflect on like you said Doug reflect on some of the basic economic issues that these companies or these hospitals are facing um ho I hopefully we'll be able to find solutions for them that are both related to tokenomics somehow uh, but again a lot to be considered there yeah, there's one more mega trend. I don't have a link here for it, but a totally different topic, perhaps. But perhaps we could focus on it at some future call or near term call. But this whole Q and Tefka thing is just a hot mess. And um, 
I think that it it deserves more attention than it's getting um, relative to the uh, well, case in point example is that it's the the new TEFCA rules are extraordinarily regressive as they relate to decentralized approaches that it's really trying to lock in 20th century hierarchical federated and centralized methods uh, to the exclusion of even fire for Christ's sakes you know that it doesn't even really allow currently um, network exchange using fire protocols which is kind of fighting with itself you know the 21st century cures act specified fire apis as a requirement yet the q and tefka regime that's coming in right behind it doesn't have a decent way to support that so it's a um, it's a it's a huge mess that if if to the extent that we thought public policy, a la the Cures Act, was going to help us drive innovation, the um, you know the Sequoia RCE Tefka uh, rules are driving us in the wrong direction. Now that's I probably shouldn't say all that given this is a recorded call, but <laughs> I think it's true. Fair enough. I didn't. I am sharing the Tefka um, site as well for anyone interested very important stuff uh, and yeah i think it would be valuable to talk about this in more detail in a future meeting too so uh, we could discuss that potentially how we'd want to go about doing that if anyone has any ideas or specific strategies to tackle this topic as it is pretty complex you know we're open to suggestions yeah unfortunately it's mind-numbingly complex yeah <laughs> It's hard to get your head around it. It's such a pervasive change, and it could just it could just peter out completely, given that it's um, it's ostensibly a voluntary program, but Health and Human Services and CMS um, have a way of pressing their you know their voluntary requirements through Medicare Medicaid, such that it becomes a de facto standard and to the extent again that it's it's somewhat regressive in its current um manifestation i think it's worth more attention than we're getting it thanks doug appreciate that um i'm going to jump into some of the educational nuggets and these are three quite long uh and time consuming pieces of content but i think are very valuable uh, in, in learning more about the topic. So the first one is an article written um, about decentralized science, more or less. And here it is, Gassing the Miracle Machine uh, by Elliot Hirschberg and Jocelyn Pearl. I know Jocelyn Pearl is very active in the decentralized science communication space. And it really just goes into the details of the history of what science sort of is how funding in science has traditionally worked and uh, what the future of science funding and research can look like using Web3. So uh, I'm not going to get into the details, uh, but one thing I just wanted to highlight is there is a really cool landscape of all, well, of the majority of decentralized science companies um, categorized by DAOs, open science, ecosystems, biotech and tech bio, arts and NFTs, publishing, data storage, protocols, foundations and institutes, financing, communities, and chats. So uh, I know this list is growing every day, really. And I just wanted to make the group here aware of, of this article. Really, really well written. Uh, the next thing I wanted to bring to your attention is, the, is an eight-hour podcast that Lex Friedman, who's, who's excellent at podcasting, uh, is a researcher at MIT and uh, does a lot of other cool stuff with robotics. Uh, I talked eight hours with Balaji um, Srinivasan, and they talk about, you know, government, social media science, the FDA, blockchain, Web3, et cetera. So if you have a full day's worth of free time and you want to check that out, I think on YouTube, they also split it up. So just wanted to bring that to your attention. Uh, really interesting thoughts there and then last but certainly not least is this bloomberg article 
which is four forty thousand words long about the crypto industry and crypto story. So for anyone who might not know anything about blockchain or crypto or is just trying to start learning about it for the first time and they like reading, this might be a great way to get started. It's it's very, you know, easy to read, uh, I think, and kind of goes over the whole history and what the future can mean. So it really does a great job kind of taking in everything that's happened in the last many, I guess, the last decade uh, since, I guess, Bitcoin, even before that. And yeah, I just wanted to highlight that for, what is it? Um, for everyone's attention. So um, yeah, any thoughts or has anyone anything else they want to share uh, we have about five minutes left for for any discussion excellent so just as a reminder if anyone's listening on youtube please subscribe uh to the hyperledger channel if you find this conversation interesting and let us know what you think in the comments as well like it if you if you think it was worthwhile and you know i want to thank everyone on the call today as well your input is extremely valuable and I love talking to you guys. And I think it's really important to keep this, these conversations going and the community uh, will hopefully benefit from it as well. So uh, thank you all again. And there's nothing else. I uh, hope you have a, a great rest of your week. Just hang with it. Ray. We need, we need to keep this going. Definitely. Yeah. And if there's any, ideas or you know specific topics um you know we discussed a few today that we want to go into more detail about i'm happy to organize an agenda uh in that way as well thank you thank you all bye thanks Ray.